Amen. Would you take a Bible this morning, turn to Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28. Uh, let me read uh, what's up on the screen this morning. And I do believe, I really do believe some of the things that I'm going to share with you. In fact, um, in 19, 1997, God uh, laid it on my heart to study prophecy. And as some of you know, I, I was not holding to the King James at that time, but, but I, was, I was reading. The Bible that I had was a King James. But I, I still hadn't been convicted yet. And this is how God led me in that direction. Because I'm going to show you some things this morning that uh, maybe you know, maybe you never knew. But how we ended up here. Isaiah 55, 5, Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not. Ask yourself the question, when God gave this particular passage to Isaiah to write down, did this country even exist? The answer is no. No one even really knew that this whole continent, North and South America, was even here. Of course, there were, there were nations living in it, but they were worshiping devils. The mounds that you see all over this nation are the high places that you find in the Old Testament. The pyramids from Mexico down into Central America and South America are those same high places where they were performing some of the worst, most wicked and vile perversions that you can imagine in honor of the solar deity, the lunar deity, and all of the other de which were the gods, they were serving those gods in this land. And so God said, Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not, and nations that knew not thee shall run unto thee because of the Lord thy God, for the Holy One of Israel, for he hath glorified thee. And I want you to think of the nation that you live in now, America, as being a country that was formed not by accident and not by the hand of man. But I believe with all my heart it was formed by the hand of God. And I'm going to prove that to you this morning, or attempt to. There up on the screen is George Washington. And I want you to notice, this is a tradition that we still have in this nation. There, are, there have been a couple of exceptions to that. Most, but not all presidents, have laid their hand on the Bible... And swore the oath of office. And by the way, I'm going to say this again. They did not promise to defend and protect the people of the United States of America. They swore to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States of America. As did all of our congressmen, even the stupid ones. Who seem to have to be reminded that we still are a nation of laws. They have to be reminded of that. But I found out that not only did, and as is depicted in the picture, this is not an actual photograph, by the way. As is depicted in the picture, notice that the Bible that is handed on is open. And according to what I read, it was opened to Deuteronomy 28. And I believe there is a reason why. As I said, there's been a couple exceptions throughout history. One in particular, which is interesting to me, when Lyndon B. Johnson uh, swore the oath of office on Air Force One shortly before they left Dallas, Texas, November 22nd, 1963. 
They brought in a judge, but could not find a Bible on Air Force One. What they found was John Kennedy's Catholic Mass book. The Missal, M-I-S-S-A-L. It basically is a book of Catholic prayers and maybe a few scriptures, but it was that book that they brought to Lyndon Johnson that he swore the oath of office on. I'm not sure that that counts. But that's what he did. But, like I say, a couple of exceptions, but nearly without exception. And I don't believe that it's I don't believe it's in the Constitution anywhere. It is just the tradition that we have in our nation that goes back to the first president, George Washington, who decided when they swore the oath to swear on, there is no greater thing to swear by or on than the Word of God. And if you remember, there was a time in this nation when you, if you went to court, and you swore to testify in a court of law, you placed your hand upon a Bible to swear that oath. The meaning behind that is that you are swearing to tell the truth and make sure that your truth is as true as the book that you're swearing upon the Word of God. Can I hear God's people say amen? Now, this is or would have been the original great seal of the United States of America. Believe it or not, the two men who were, the, in my opinion, the founding fathers who were the farthest away from God that you can get, Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson, who both knew the Bible, they read the scriptures. They just didn't believe most of it. They were called deists. They believed that, yes, there was a God, that God created the universe, but then God just sort of stood back and let things happen. And yet, it was Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson who, when given the task of creating a, sig a signet or a sign or a symbol for our nation and what it represented which goes along with Deuteronomy 28, what you see is, at the top, is the pillar of cloud that Israel followed through the wilderness. What you also see up on the hill, let me get my pen out here, draw some circles around some things. What you see here is Moses and the Israelites on the far shore of the Red Sea, and this is Pharaoh drowning in the Red Sea. And the motto was, rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. But it was the idea that God had brought His people across the sea to put them into a land that he was going to give them. A land that was flowing with milk and honey. A land that was going to free them. Come on. From the bondage that they were in. To the church of Rome. To the church of England. The bondage to Bloody Mary, Queen of Scots who was the queen before King James of England, who murdered countless numbers of Puritan Christians simply because they would not bow down to the Pope of Rome. They paid for their faith with their own lives and their own blood. And they sought a land that they could come to so that they could be free to worship God the way they believed God was leading them to worship according to the Word of God and not according to the Queen and not according to the Archbishop of Canterbury and not according to the Pope of Rome. Can I hear God's people say amen? Now, Deuteronomy 28. Remember, 
George Washington's hand is on Deuteronomy 28 as he's swearing to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States of America. Here is a portion of what Deuteronomy 28 says. And it shall come to pass that thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all, underline this, nations of the earth. Ask yourself the question. This little 13 colony nation that got its start by a revolutionary war freeing themselves from the bondage of King George in England, did not God set that same nation on high above all the other nations in the world? Was it not the United States of America that was called to arms to defeat the tyrants both in Berlin and Tokyo and defeated them? That war would have been lost without our boys fighting for freedom. Somebody say amen. amen. Was it not this nation that many, in fact, practically all of our forefathers came to this land seeking asylum, seeking um, freedom, liberty, seeking the opportunity to live without harassment, seeking the opportunity to work and create their own prosperity. Was it not this land that they came to and no other? I mean, when the Irish ran out of potatoes, they didn't go to Russia for potatoes. They came to America. When the Bosnians had to leave their land, they came to America. When refugees from all over the world for the last 200 years were seeking a better place to live, were they not seeking to live in this nation? Somebody say amen. What was it that made this nation so great? You're looking at it. The laws of God made this nation the great nation that it was. Amen. amen. Look at verse 2. And all these blessings shall... Look at this. All these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Blessed shalt thou be in the city. You wouldn't catch me dead in a city. Well, you might catch me dead in a city. But I tell you, I wouldn't by choice live in one. And blessed shalt thou be in the field. Have you not ever flown through or over America or driven through America? What do you see when you drive through Iowa and Kansas? Corn and soybeans. Indiana, corn and soybeans. Used to be cotton everywhere. Blessed shalt be, shalt be the fruit of thy body. And how many grandparents had houses over 10 or 12? Raise your hand. Somebody in your family lived in a house where there was about 10 or 15 children everywhere. Amen? And the fruit of thy ground and the fruit of thy cattle and the increase of thy kind and the flocks of thy sheep. Let me tell you, let me give you a little history lesson. Did you, do you not remember that at one time this nation outlawed alcohol? And this nation became a prosperous nation without alcohol. And do you not understand that when they repealed that amendment and started drinking again, that God filled the heart of this nation with dust. And thousands of people lost their farms. Do you not understand that the Great Depression came Right after they started drinking again. And do you not understand. That when our boys started fighting the war. To end all wars. And our homes started turning to prayer again. God bless this nation again. And now do we not see. That because we've outlawed. Prayer. 
Bible reading, the Ten Commandments, out of our schools, out of our homes, and even out of our churches. How close to God do we stand now? God said, verse 5, Blessed shall be thy basket and thy store. Blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out. You see, God blessed the crops of this nation before Monsanto started messing with the genetics of it. The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face, and they shall come out against thee one way and flee before thee seven ways. And the Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in, the, in thy storehouses and in all that thou settest thine hand unto do. And he shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. And the Lord shall establish thee and holy people unto himself as he has sworn unto thee if thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways. And all the people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord and they shall be afraid of thee. And the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods and in the fruit of thy body and in the fruit of thy cattle and in the fruit of thy ground and in the land which the Lord swore unto thy fathers to give thee. The Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure. You know what that is? Bibles. Bibles. First book ever printed in the United States of America was a King James Bible. And the heaven to give the rain unto the land in his season and to bless all the work of thine hand. And thou shalt lend unto many nations and thou shalt not borrow. And George Washington knew this when he had the Bible open to that particular place when he laid his hand on that book and swore the oath to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, both foreign and domestic. Now, I'm going to give you some history lesson. How hungry are you? For knowledge. Here's the first charter of Virginia, 1606, by King James. We greatly commending and graciously accepting of their desires for the furtherance of so noble a work, which may by the providence of Almighty God hereafter tend to the glory of His divine majesty in propagating of Christian religion to such people as yet live in darkness and miserable ignorance of the true knowledge and worship of God and may in time bring the infidels and savages living in those parts to human civility and to a settled and quiet government. You know what that means? See, we don't talk that way anymore. It wasn't wealth that they were coming over here for. It wasn't money. It wasn't gold. They knew that there were people living over here who had never heard the gospel. So you know what they came over here to do? You know what they asked King James of England to let them come over here for? To find those savages and infidels and bring them to the knowledge of the gospel so that they could be saved so that their women would put shirts on because they were savages and they were living in a savage way and when they brought Christianity over here they said you know what ladies you ought to put a shirt on the separatist in 1608 here's their church covenant they shook off this yoke of anti-Christian bondage. They're talking about the Church of England, the Church of Rome, as the Lord's free people joined themselves by a covenant of the Lord. That's what Deuteronomy 28 is. It is, was the covenant that God was making with His people in that land. He said, you can live in this land if you will obey my laws and keep my statutes and judgments. That was God's covenant. George Washington knew it. Our founding fathers knew it. Those early settlers came over here knowing Deuteronomy 28 and they knew the power behind it. They knew that if they came over here for wealth or for riches or for any other thing that God would curse them. But they knew if they came over here to worship God the way the Bible dictated to them that God would bless them. And he did. By a covenant of the Lord into a church of state and the fellowship of the gospel to walk in all his ways made known unto them according to their best endeavors whatsoever should cost them the Lord assisting them. William Brewster, 1629. This is what, now, here's what I want you to get your mindset in. Between, I'm going to say 1619 and 1650, somewhere around in there, they called it the Great Migration. 
thousands of people left England, left Europe to come to this land. And they saw themselves, they were, they, it's like they were looking in a mirror and what they saw was Israel. That they were Israel and that God was bringing them across the sea to a land flowing with milk and honey that they would live in that land by God's grace and under covenant with God that as long as they honored God and his laws and statutes that God would bless them in that land that's how they saw themselves you didn't learn that in public school did you you learned that pilgrims wore big hats and they ate turkey and they had Indians with them. But you didn't learn what a pilgrim really was. He was a man who was tired of living in bondage. Are you listening to me? When you're a man and you are tired of living in bondage and living in fear then you can become a pilgrim and ask God to put you into a place where you can live free. William Brewster, 1629, said this, the church that had been brought over the ocean now saw another church, the firstborn in America. You see what he just said? He just said, we're Israel crossing the sea going to a new land. Holding the same faith and the same simplicity of self-government under Christ alone. So in Exodus 15, 22, so Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. They went out into the wilderness of Shur and they went three days in the wilderness, found no water. Exactly what William Brewster said was exactly what happened with Moses and his people going into the promised land. And our forefathers knew that. You're not going to hear Hillary ever talk about things like this. Or... What's her name? That goofy senator. Court. Elizabeth Warren. Uh, excuse me. Um, um, Elizabeth Warren, who is uh, like one thirty-second Indian. That's her. Pocahontas. You'll you'll never hear her talk about this. No, they'll never say. They will not tell you. They will not tell you that that was the beginning of our nation. William Bradford, describing their departure from Holland to America, said this. So being ready to depart, they had a day of solemn humiliation. Their pastor taking his text from Ezra 8.21. And there at the river by Ahava, I proclaimed a fast that we might humble ourselves before our God and seek of him a right way for us and for our children and for our substance. The rest of the time was spent in pouring out prayers to the Lord with great fervency, mixed with abundance of tears. So they left the goodly and pleasant city, which had been their resting place for nearly 12 years, but they knew they were pilgrims. Hebrews 12, read it. But lift their eyes to the heavens, their dearest country, and quieted their spirits. They were looking for the promised land. And America was it. What can now sustain them but the Spirit of God and His grace? May not and ought not the children of these fathers rightly say, Our fathers were Englishmen which came over this great ocean and were ready to perish in this wilderness. Do you not see the timing? That as God brought Israel out of Egypt, crossed the sea, stopped at Mount Sinai to give them the written law of God. Then they went into the promised land. Are you following me? Because in 1998, I was thinking these exact thoughts. And it dawned on me. 1620, 1619, 1620, the start of the Great Migration. But Ron, before they left England... God gave them the Word of God, 1611. Do you see the timing of it? After the greatest Bible that the earth has ever known. 
after it came into print, then God started bringing His people with that book to this land. And I went, the King James Bible's right in everything that it says. That was my epiphany day. And I've believed every word since then. Because my granddaddy, a Southern Baptist preacher, believed every word of it. And my forefathers in the faith who came to this land believed this book and they saw themselves in it. Being God's people moved to a land flowing with milk and honey. So here's what I'm going to ask you. Did it fail in Israel? Yes. Is it failing here? Yes. So what's going to happen here is what has happened to Israel. The Charter of the Plymouth Council in 1620, King James said, "...and hope thereby to advance the enlargement of the Christian religion to the glory of God Almighty." Having, this is what happened to Mayflower. Having been blown off course to Virginia, they landed at Cape Cod. They were supposed to land in Virginia, and they got blown off course. November 11, 1620, little did they know that they had, landed, had they landed there a few years earlier, they would have been massacred by the Patuxent Indians. The tribe, however, had been completely destroyed by a plague in 1617. Timing. Timing. Here's the Mayfl Here's when you're on a ship, you're ruled by the captain. Before they leave the ship to go settle on the ground, they need a law to govern them. They're not just going to go there and live in an anarchist way. Before they left that ship, they said, we're going to establish a government that will rule us. See, men need to be governed. Or men will become animals. So here's what, they, here's what these men agreed. In the name of God, amen. We whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign Lord King James, by the grace of God of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, King, defender of the faith, having undertaken for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith and honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia. They were off a little bit. Do by these presents solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and of one another covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid. And by virtue here, hereof to enact, constitute, and frame such and just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and offices from time to time, as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony, under which we promise all due submission and obedience. And I've underlined that it was for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith. That's why they came here. First Charter of Massachusetts, 1629. For as much as the good and prosperous success of the plantation and of the said parts of New England and for the directing, ruling and disposing of all other matters and things whereby our said people, inhabitants, there may be so religiously, peaceably and civilly governed as their good life and orderly conversation may win and incite, listen to this, incite the natives of the country to the, they didn't come over here to kill them. They came over here to save them. To the knowledge and obedience of the only true God and Savior of mankind and the Christian faith, which is our royal intention. And the adventures of free profession is the principal end of this plantation. We came over here to live and preach the gospel. That was all well and good till the Kennedy showed up. John Cotton, Puritan minister, most influential leader in shaping of the future of New England. 1636, based his code of laws on the scriptures. Isaiah 33, 22, for the Lord our God is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king. And in that, you have the tricameral system of government. The judicial, executive, and legislative. But only God is king. 
It was in the Bible that they found our form of government. And you didn't learn that in school. Uh, let's see here. I got a lot here. Constitution of the New England Federation, 1643. Whereas we all came to these parts of America with the same end and aim, namely to advance the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ and to enjoy the liberties of the gospel thereof with purities and peace and for preserving and propagating the truth and liberties of the gospel. New Haven Colony Charter, 1644. The judicial laws of God as they were delivered by Moses are to be a rule to all the courts in this jurisdiction. And to this day... Carved into the door of the Supreme Court of the United States of America is the Ten Commandments. So it seems kind of hypocritical that the courts of this country would rule that no judge could have a copy of the Ten Commandments in their courtroom while our Supreme Court has the Ten Commandments carved into the door. Seems hypocritical to me. Who's ever heard of the old deluder Satan law? You know that one? Here's why you have to go to school in America. When in Muslim countries, if you're a woman, you're not even allowed to go to school. Here's why you have to go. It being one of the chief projects of that old deluder Satan to keep men from the knowledge of the scriptures as in former time, and that learning may not be buried in the grave of our forefathers in church and commonwealth, it is therefore ordered by this court that every township within this jurisdiction, after the Lord hath increased them to the number of 50 householders, shall forthwith appoint one within their town to teach all such children as shall resort to him to write and read. And it is further ordered that where any town shall increase to the number of 100 families or householders, they shall be set upon a grammar school for the university. The purpose of building a school, they said, was to teach our children to read the Bible so that Satan wouldn't lie to them and they would believe it anymore. You see, because their forefathers came out of a time when the Catholic Church wouldn't let you read the Bible. And men like John Wycliffe, who was a Catholic priest in England, saw the corruption that was handed down by the priests of Rome in England who were stealing widows' houses, just like the Bible said, and set about himself to translate the Bible from Latin to English so that people in England could be free by reading the Bible. Maryland, I won't read that. Uh, this was uh, John Eliot, Puritan clergyman, known as the Apostle to the Indians. Here's what he said. The scripture is able thoroughly to furnish the man of God, whether magistrate in the commonwealth or elder in the church or any other, unto every good work. Written word of God is the perfect system or frame of laws to guide all the moral actions of man, either towards God or man. Roger Williams, that they pursuing with peaceable, loyal minds, sober, serious, and religious intentions and the holy Christian faith, a most flourishing civil state may stand and best be maintained, grounded upon gospel principles. People don't talk that way anymore. Peter Bulkley said this, we are as a city set upon a hill. He got that from scripture. In the open view of all the earth, we profess ourselves to be a people in covenant with God. This brings us back to Deuteronomy 28. We were established in this land under a covenant with God to be God's people. Liberals don't like that. Heathen don't like that. Atheists don't like that. But that's how we were set forth here in this land. That's our history. That's our heritage. And I won't be ashamed of it. Because Hyun Mi is supposed to come back Wednesday night. She said in Korea, there are churches over there, but they're so corrupt and they've gone so far away from the Bible. 
she married an American and chooses to become a citizen of this country instead of Korea so that she can come to a church that still believes the Word of God. So it doesn't matter whether you're Asian, African, Indian, European, you can come to America and still hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And throughout the history of this country, uh, let's go back to Isaiah 55. Well, if I stayed to read all, you'd be really hungry. John Winthrop, we are entered into covenant with him for this work. If the Lord shall please to hear us and bring us in peace to the place we desire, then he hath ratified this covenant and sealed our commission. And that is exactly what happened. Isaiah 55, verse 5, Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not. Now, I believe that that nation is a spiritual nation. We are, as saved people, we are sons of God. We're not sons of Adam anymore. We're not sons of Moses. We're not sons of, of anybody else. We are sons of God. And that makes us of a peculiar race, a peculiar people, a different nation. And it doesn't matter from what area or what nation or what land or what tribe you came from he says in verse 5 um, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not and nations that knew not thee shall run unto thee because of the Lord thy God my ancestry is from England but before Jesus and the gospel was preached in England, my forefathers worshipped oak trees and were pagans. And some of your forefathers were Africans. And before the gospel was preached in Africa, your forefathers worshipped idols, fetishes. False gods. And yet God has seen fit so that our people from all races and nations could come into this land and hear the gospel preached. Somebody say amen. Now, I've got a place I'm going to here. If I can find it. Hebrews 11, turn there. My question to you is, can we get America back to the gospel? It's a good question. And I'm going to say this, while I stand in support of some of the things that our president has done, by and large, the man is an infidel. He's a whoremonger. And the shame of it is, we've tried to elect people in this country who said they were Christians who didn't even come close to acting that way once they got in office. And the shame of it is that a wicked man has to stand up and do what the righteous 
should have already done. Can I hear God's people say amen? amen? I believe that it's possible that through much tribulation, our nation can be turned back to God. What are we willing to sacrifice for that? Our lives? Our fortunes? For the sake of our children and our grandchildren to live, to have the gospel preached to them the way it was preached to our generation. Because our forefathers in this land stood ready to sacrifice their life, their land, and their fortune for the freedom of their posterity. We should be no less resolved. Now, if it fails, and God has already written Ichabod over the house of of America. We have a better place. Amen. Hebrews 11 verse 10. That let's back up to verse 8. By faith Abraham when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance obeyed and he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Now I absolutely firmly believe what I've preached to you this morning. I absolutely believe that God built this nation. Built upon solid biblical laws and principles. Of that I have no doubt. If that were not the case, we would either be under the bondage of the, of the Bishop of Rome, the Pope of Rome, or some other tyrant. But we have freedom in this nation to say, sodomy is wrong, adultery is wrong, witchcraft is wrong. These things are wicked. We have the freedom to say that in this land. If that freedom is taken away, where do we go from here? Canada? Mexico? Japan? Russia? There is no place left. This literally is the end of the world. Because once you hit California, that's it. Nothing left. Yeah, in the ocean. So verse 13 of Hebrews 11. These all died in faith, not having received the promises. But having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. I love this country. When I'm gone away from it, all I want is to come back to it. I love my people. I love my nation. I love my constitution. And I love our laws. To me, there is no greater place than this place. But we stand in jeopardy every day of civil war. Am I telling the truth? And it would put American against American, as in days gone by. And we may never recover from that. But I have a country. Verse 14, for they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they'd been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. 
But now they desire a better country. That is, and heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He hath prepared for them a city. If I can't live in a free America, then I would rather not live at all. If my children and my grandchildren cannot live in a land where the gospel can make men free, then I would rather they die to live in a better country. I'm not Jim Jones. We have not fixed special Kool-Aid downstairs for everybody. I'm a Christian first, then an American. Not the other way around. And my faith is worth living for because it is worth dying for. A lot of blood was shed and a lot of lives were lost in that migration as they came from bondage to this land. That's why to them it was so precious. Those of you who have stood and fought for the flag of this nation doesn't particularly like the guy who tramples on the flag of this nation. Because that flag was bought and paid for by blood of men who gave their life in sacrifice. Amen? So you can feel strongly about that, don't you? So you should feel just as strongly for the land that we're going to that was bought and paid for by the blood of one man Christ now let me hear you say amen, amen. The other amen, amen. Yeah. our pilgrims You know the story of Squanto. It was an Indian. English. Taught. And he got his first. And that first year. Half of them died. They starved to death. Got got. It was God who had prepared to teach them how to live. So that's giving man together. Did I lose my microphone? Mike, shut up. I said, God. There we go. But it was God who had prepared the way. And I don't know what the future is going to hold. I'm told that there are 50,000 sealed indictments ready to be handed down for guilty congressmen and judges. I hope it happens. But it'll start a war. It'll start a war. Because they won't voluntarily turn themselves in. Anything worth living for is worth dying for. Amen. Let's bow our heads. I know you're hungry. I could teach history all day long. 
but I, I mean it. It was learning that about my country that God used to lead me to believe that the words in this book were true. God had prepared the words to send over for them to live by. And when our forefathers didn't have anything else but a pick, a shovel, a hole, and a Bible, they made their way in this land. Father in heaven, we come before you today, free people. But that freedom has been bought and paid for by the blood of our forefathers. Men and women who lived and died in faith. It was built on the backs of families who were not weak. Men who were not lazy. It was built upon the faith of those who had suffered under the cruelties of England and Rome. It was bought and paid for by the blood of soldiers. First on the north and then on the south. That freedom was bought and paid for by those brave men at Omaha Beach. And by those men in Korea. And those men in Saigon and those men in Iraq and those men who carry shields who protect our neighborhoods day and night so that we can sleep in peace we thank you God that we are still a nation of laws Laws that are based upon your laws. Father, help us to always stand for this nation and for its freedom. And to stand willing to give our lives, our fortunes, our lands, and our sacred honor for our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren to be able to live in a land where the gospel can still be preached. But Father, if we lose this land, we look forward to a better country. So Father, we come before you today thankful to be Americans. Thankful to be free. Help us, Father, to never squander that freedom by our unrighteousness. But to live thankfully under that freedom by our righteousness. To honor the men, to honor the women, to honor the faithful. Who stood for the gospel in this country. And then who took that gospel and went into the four corners of the earth from this land. To preach that gospel. Father we pray dear God that you would help us and this little church. To carry that gospel into lands unknown. To make men free. Though Satan himself oppose us, we stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. And we avow to never again be entangled in the yoke of bondage. Bless your free people today. Make more men free by the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray this in agreement together in the name of Jesus God's only begotten Son, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Would you stand to your feet?